A gun or bear spray? If you're in the backcountry and you're confronted with an aggressive bear, which would you rather have in your hand? Make no mistake, this is a loaded question. No pun intended. Because the internet has very intense opinions on this subject. But Mike Godfrey, who's been writing about bear attacks for more than 10 years, has worked with several wildlife biologists at the forefront of study of effective backcountry deterrence. Now he says that he has the definitive answer to this question. So definitive that he created a video that he says is the holy grail of information to debunk all of the myths and misunderstood information. Now I've watched this video and I've got a lot of questions. And so here's my conversation with Mike. If you've ever wanted to be a supporter of this channel, the best way to do that is to be a supporter of our sponsors. It is really expensive to do what we do, but the easiest and the fastest way is just to support the people who actually support this channel. And by far the biggest supporter of this channel is Onyx Backcountry. Well, let me back up. Let me tell you who they are in the first place. It's an app company to help you navigate in the backcountry, but it doesn't just help you navigate. They released a brand new feature in their app that turns it into a multi-activity app. So now, in addition to us backpackers, where it helps you find campsites, it helps you find water sources, it helps you determine the weather. It now does all of that for hikers, mountain bikers, skiers, and climbers. And as a thank you for supporting them, like you'd be supporting our channel, they have given me a code for you for 20% off the app for the entire year. So to have the best way to navigate out in the backcountry, get Onyx Backcountry for like 23 bucks for the entire year. Thanks to Onyx Backcountry for supporting this channel. We really appreciate all you guys do. Well, Mike, thanks for being on, man. I appreciate you being here. The, uh, yeah, the man, the, the myth, the legend of the infamous bear spray versus uh, guns video. Uh, tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about you, just kind of what your what your background is and that kind of thing. That kind of thing. Yeah, so about for 10 years or so, I've been working pretty much exclusively in the outdoor industry, mostly making informational media. I do some writing for uh, KSL.com. They're the Intermountain, Edge, the Intermountain Region's largest news organization. And then on top of that, I've done some work with the Forest Service um, on occasion. Um, have some contact with the Park Service about some of their um, objectives and goals and issues that they're having and all sorts of stuff, so... Anything outdoors, that's kind of where I spend my time. Okay. So then all of a sudden you just decided to make a video about guns versus bear spray or what what was how did that well, how no. did that come about? Well, it really I mean, I think it's like anybody, right? So we all anybody who spends time in the outdoors immediately starts thinking about these big fuzzy creatures. And if you don't think about it, whenever you tell somebody you got hiking, there's like, Well, what about bears? Aren't they gonna come and eat you or something like that? I mean, so, I mean, years ago, when I was a teenager, you know, you start thinking about it. But I, I really just decided about a couple of decades ago that I needed to educate myself and not just find something online that told me what I wanted to hear. Like, I needed to jump super deep into this so that I understand the bears and they, and I can keep myself safe in the backcountry. And that's a little bit difficult, um, if I'm honest. I mean, we have the internet in our modern age. But the problem is, it's just like there's so much information and so much information that gets tainted by mythology, gets tainted by social um, influences or just politics, you know, just gets in the middle and can kind of sabotage people in the backcountry. And when it came to my safety, my life, I just didn't really care. So about 20 years ago, I started educating myself and then, you know, through writing about the outdoors, creating informational media, I've been fortunate to come across the actual experts, you know, the individuals who are actually out there studying bear attacks who have better data than anybody else. And I've also been able, I'm fortunate to, been, to have been able to interview several people who have actually been attacked. And then I just add on top of that, my experience. And in the last 15 years or so, I've had hundreds of bear encounters just in just about every circumstance you can imagine. So where are you from? I'm from Utah. Okay, so you're in Utah right now? I am in Utah right now. <clears throat> oh, awesome. Okay, so uh, you you kind of said in the video that the bear spray versus guns debate is complicated. And mm -hmm. I had no idea. So I, um, for those that don't know about me at all, if you're watching this, um, 
I, I was a, f- uh, a former firearms instructor. I did that for a couple of years. So, you know, I, I find myself pretty proficient with firearms. But I thought it was interesting that this was a debate that was even out there. I mean, I, I don't follow that whole world. I mean, I carry bear spray when I go backpacking. Um, I have no problems with firearms. And f- watching this video, it just blew my mind that this was as hot of a topic as it is. Why is it so complicated? Well, I mean, I can't get into everybody's mind um, as to why it's complicated for them. I think it's largely because a lot of people, I mean, bears, I mean, they don't really enter most of, like for most of us, they're just not part of our daily lives. They're not part of our consciousness until a news story pops up where somebody gets attacked. And then, you know, that gets a conversation going through various social groups, whether it's, you know, at your local gun range or whether it's a backpacking forum or something like that. People start trading back their ideas about how to stay safe. And I think it just it just gets all muddled in there. And you just get a lot of, you know, for lack of a better term, mythology that gets worked into kind of the social narrative and people start confusing mythology for what we actually do and do not know about. Well, it seemed to get super political. Like, I, I feel like it became a, a really political argument, which I don't think your intent, the intent of your video was all, was at all political. I felt like you did yeah. a pretty good job of sort of like trying to defuse. I, I sort of felt like the overlying tone of um, almost like I got to stop these trolls once and for all. Let me just like, <laughs> let's just make this video. I, I'm so sick of hearing about it this way and so sick about it this way. Let's just talk about reality. Was that kind of the basis of that whole video? Yeah. You know, I, I'm apolitical. I, I, I don't go for, I don't join political groups. I've not found them to be particularly helpful. If I'm political, it's backcountry political in the sense that I want people to be able to enjoy the backcountry safely and responsibly. And the only way to do that is to overcome a lot of false narratives and kind of the mythology that's out there. And because I've been engaging in it for like more than 20 years, and yeah, there's resources everywhere. And there are people on YouTube that just have millions of views that are out there telling people this and that about guns versus bear spray. And they show, I mean, it turns into, they kind of devolve along a lot of different paths. And for me, it was just like this, this is not right. We got to We got to find true north here. We have to find true north and people need to be able to understand what is true, what is factual and what is just straight up nonsense and what is eh, somewhere in between. Because there are some areas where, I mean, bear safety, every time you go out there, bears are different, people are different, skill thresholds are different. There's just a lot of variables. And so there is a little bit of gray space. Yeah. Um, and I just didn't really feel like I was finding all that much where people were I didn't feel like we were, we had very good access to really good resources. So I'm just like, no, I got to throw my hat in the ring and I got to okay. do what I can to try to straighten things out. Is that why you said at the beginning of the video that this was the holy grail of videos? Yeah, it's because it's so difficult to find, right? I mean, the internet, it's not a lack of information. It's an overabundance of information and then sorting out what's reliable in that. It's just a very difficult thing to do. And unless you have kind of really achieved a a certain level of understanding that's uncommon it's very difficult for your average person to kind of sift through all of it so the video seemed to lean uh obviously more towards bear spray being more effective and is, is that right or, or or am i reading well, that wrong i i wouldn't say that but i understand where you're coming from what i do say in my video is that there is no intelligent reason to not take bear spray and the basic, the basic kind of rationale behind that is that it is, it is highly effective. Um, people online who tell you it's not don't know what they're talking about. It's that simple. Now, it's not a 100% guarantee because nothing is, right? But it's highly effective, much easier to master, much easier to use, right? Just the skill threshold for bear spray is much, much lower than firearms. It's not that a firearm can't be equally as effective, but if we're talking statistically, Statistically speaking, it's not as effective, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a flaw with the machinery. The, it could, it's more likely to be a flaw with the user. There's just so much that can go wrong when you're relying on a firearm. 
And a lot of it has to do with whether or not you are sufficiently proficient and whether or not you can read the situation and respond in an sure. appropriate time. As opposed to bear spray, which is a sustained spray of this really terrible chemical yeah. that it's much easier to hit a bear when it's running at you. So, and it's non-lethal, you know. And I think anybody who goes into the backcountry should have the objective, one, of course, keep themselves safe. But I think we should also have a goal to not harm wildlife unless it's necessary. You yeah, know? I think I think you did a good job at least talking through a lot of the data that's out there. Um and talking through how I th- I, th- I thought it was interesting how um, a lot of the cases that you brought up where guns were involved, where it really just more so ticked off the bear than really did a whole lot more. And, and, and it seemed almost like bear spray uh, worked well as a deterrent because no, the bear just didn't want to be around anymore. Like I can't I don't like what is it what I'm experiencing. I'm out. And so I felt like. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if I, if I'm going to put my firearms or, uh, inst- instructor hat back on proficiency yeah. is, is king in that situation. I can't tell you how many people I had in classes that, um, were, were gun owners their entire life. And then yeah. when I watched them pick up a gun, I would, I wanted to leave the room. I mean, it was, it was scary yeah. to see what I saw. So I, I totally yeah. understand where that comes from. And so bear spray is non-lethal. I get it. And, but if we're taking like the user out, if it's like if both people are extremely proficient, like I've been working with bear spray for 20 years, I've been working with guns for 20 years, I'm proficient at both, I could, you know, have it in a holster position, pull it out in under, you know, two seconds, whatever. In that situation, um, in your, um, the end result of that was what, which one is better in, in, in your mind? Yeah, I would say that that, you know, and I try and say it in the video that I think that's actually framing the discussion the wrong way. Okay, all right. So I think that the better way of viewing the discussion is that these are both tools, and both tools have their appropriate and inappropriate uses, right? Yep. And that's really the message that I tried to get across. Because when you start getting into this, which is better, for one, I don't think that question is even answerable, and I'll tell you why. Because... Every situation, I've been writing about bear attacks for more than 10 years. I've been talking to some of the, you know, biologists who are at the forefront of understanding how to stay safe in the backcountry. The variables from one attack to the next, the circumstances, the individuals involved, there are so many variables, you can never make a clean comparison. It's just not possible, right? Now, where you can make a distinction is that if a bear is a persistent threat, um, and this has on occasion happened. You can find examples. There was the recent example in Banff National Park where we had a couple up there with their dog. Now, this you have to be careful because there's so much we don't know about that attack, but they had at least one can of, of expelled bear spray. There have been mixed reports about two cans, um, and they were still killed along with their dog, right? Now, we can assume for the sake of argument that the bear spray failed just for the sake of argument. The bear, if it still poses a threat, only a firearm in the right hand, the proper firearm in the right hands, is going to end the threat once and for all. Bear spray just can't do it in the long run. Um, and that's coming straight from Tom Smith, who, again, he's the, you know, biologist that I depend on a lot. He's written most of the definitive work on the topic, um, along with, you know, Steve Guerrero. And that's the thing, is the proper tool, the firearm can be used to scare a bear, and the Firearm can be used to put down a bear if that bear is a persistent threat. However, if that is where you're going, people really need to understand the consequence. Like they need to understand, one, the discipline needed to use that firearm correctly up to that point. And then they need to cooperate with wildlife managers. And while, I mean, there's, there are people out there that are worried, well, you know, Big Brother is going to come get me. Um, but the fact of the matter is, whether you're in Montana, Alaska, you are, you're right to defend yourself is baked into their response to incidents with bears. And if you legitimately did everything you could to avoid a conflict and your life was in danger, then you are justified. But there are some stipulations. There are some things that you're required to do afterwards. So, but then you go to bear spray. Bear spray can't put an animal down, but it's been shown to be extremely effective. And if somebody knows how to use it, it's almost a guarantee, almost a guarantee that the firearm won't be necessary. Yeah, and I, I, I agree that somebody needs to be proficient with a firearm. 
I mean, you have to. Mm. If anybody's ever tried to uh, fire a firearm f- uh, and retrieving it from a holster position, it is it's yeah. not easy to do. And then to uh, accurately fire under stress, it's not easy yeah. to do. And um, if if I like if I'm with a group of people, um, even with bear spray, let's say I'm with five or six people, and each of us has a can of bear spray, I could probably bet that almost zero of them have ever even unloaded a can of bear spray before. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? That's just like I've got a can of bear spray. I went and bought it at the 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 outdoor store. I'm out here with it. It's gonna protect me somehow. I don't know how. It's gonna yeah. protect me. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna stick it in the back of my backpack somewhere. So when I see a bear, yeah. I'm going to take off my backpack, I'm going to pull it out, and then I'm going to have it at the ready. Uh, but from what I've seen in just the recent couple weeks of just kind of studying, not really studying, but just kind of learning about and reading about some of these mm-hmm. bear attacks, uh, yeah. these charges are so fast. I mean, and they're, I mean, within seconds, this bear is on top of you if they're, re- if they're really trying to attack you. that You don't even, a lot of these people didn't even have time to unholster their bear spray which I thought was really no. interesting. So if I'm in a proficiency situation, yeah, I'm gonna. I would rather hand a can of bear spray to somebody than a gun, <laughs> right? <laughs> if they can't, if they can't unholster a can of bear spray, like I feel like if they can't unholster a can of bear spray and know how to use it effectively and put it in the right, I'm sure as heck not gonna want them to unholster a firearm and have some yeah. sort of a negligent discharge or, uh, you know, or something's gonna go dramatically wrong where they're going to hurt themselves or somebody else uh you know i just think i think that's just such a i don't know i if if you're if you're out with all these people what are you handing them like if you got new guys out there are you handing them a gun or are you handing them bear spray i i would never travel with somebody in the backcountry um who's carrying a gun unless i knew their habits with that firearm very well so if i'm just meeting up with somebody and I've never met them before, and they're carrying a firearm. I'm like, okay, you go ahead, walk 20 minutes ahead of me, and I'll, I'll start when I'm good and ready. It's just because in the backcountry, you're so far away from emergency help if something does go wrong. Um, statistically, you're just, I mean, you just got to make sure if somebody does have a firearm, that they're the right person to be carrying that firearm. And it's not just, and this is the hard thing, and this is really difficult for a lot of people to understand. Even if you know, even if your buddy down the street is a member of SEAL Team 6, um, addressing a threat from a bear is not the same as engaging in urban combat. It's just not the same thing. There are big differences. For one, um, in urban combat, somebody's going to duck and try and find cover. You don't have time for that with a bear, right? And their weaponry is all close range. So your best bet is not to move your feet. Just if they're charging you, stand there and then deploy your turn. If you got somebody who's proficient enough with the right firearm, Absolutely, have them draw, but have everybody else there with bear spray, right? Because, I mean, and here's the thing, especially like if I'm by myself, um, I'll still go for the bear spray typically first unless I have a strong headwind, right? That's kind of the one example I give people where bear spray is maybe going to become a liability. Are, are you carrying um, both typically? I can, It depends on where I'm at, right? And so here in Utah, we don't have brown bears. Um, I will sometimes carry both, but most of the time, the, when you the say one brown bear, always carry. Uh, no, no, to, uh, I'm sorry, I, mean, I don't mean to keep interrupting you, but when you say brown, I was no, no, say, no, fine. I understand. Tell me the difference between brown bear, black bear, grizzly. Are you so referring to grizzly? Brown bear and grizzly, yeah. So brown bear and grizzly are essentially the same thing. So okay. technically, right. they're, grizzly is just a subcategory of brown okay. bear, right? So you have okay. Kodiaks, you have northern coastal brown bears, then you have grizzlies. They're all kind of still the same species, but they're different populations. And then black bears, and this is, and I'm glad you brought this up because I don't know who came up with the names, brown bear, black bear, because they're the worst names of the world. Because um, brown bears can be black, black bears are often brown, and it really confuses people. But yeah, so black bear as a species, um, yeah, there's a time and a place when a firearm would be useful, so sometimes I do carry. But like I said, the one thing that I never go hiking without is a can of bear spray. That's my absolute minimum threshold, so... And again, it depends on where I'm going, if I'm by myself, if I'm in brown bear country, something like that. In, in the video, you mentioned that there are internet trolls that seek out to make arguments on the effectiveness of bear spray. And a lot of them talk about wind and bear spray. Why? Well, I mean, 
When you're talking about internet trolls, internet trolls always have an agenda and they'll find any argument they can to further their agenda, right? And when you're talking about spray, then yeah, wind is going to affect spray. There's just no, I mean, anybody who says it's not going to just is not connected to reality. And some people, I mean, there's there are people online that say the bear spray failed because it didn't reach full for a full 30 feet, right? Um, so there are environmental environmental factors that affect the range of bear spray. And it's something, something that you need to be aware of if you're going to be proficient with that tool. But that just means you need to adjust your range. And it's the same with a firearm, right? I have a much longer range with a rifle than I do with a handgun. Sure. Um, it's the same thing. You just have to understand your tool. It's that simple. Even in pretty su- significant winds, pretty strong winds, um, according to um, a paper that Tom Smith published, up about 23 miles per hour, you can still get five to six feet of solid, um, effective range out of bear spray. You know, that's a pretty good wind. So it's just something you have to be aware of. So whenever I've unloaded a can of bear spray, I mean, we're talking, I, I've never timed it, but I would guess I, if, if out of memory, 10 seconds, maybe 15 total of until my can, <laughs> my can is completely empty. Do you, yeah, I, I you know, you I've know. had some in six seconds. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, so, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm probably off on that. Cause I, like I said, I've never like timed it, but I've noticed it's really quick. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you know, in the firearms world, you know, uh, the size of your magazine is often King, right? So the more rounds you got in your weapon, people love that. And so, you know, if you can find a, a gun that's got, you know, seven rounds or eight rounds of, oh, I've got one, 12 or whatever. I've got more firing power. I've got more. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I find that to be interesting. I mean, would you recommend people carry two cans of bear spray? Um, you know, if I'm going to be heading into the deep backcountry and there's just maybe I'm by myself or maybe me and one other person, um, it's, I, you know, I'm again, I'm borrowing from Tom Smith. He, he made a really great analysis. I've never been able to find a better one. It's like a seed bell, right? So when you're driving a car or riding in a car, you should always have your seatbelt on. How many of us have actually needed that seatbelt when we hopped into the car, right? It's the same with bear spray. When you get into the backcountry, you want to always have some. And that includes if you've actually had a bear encounter, you need to have a backup in case that threat persists, right? So that's, that's one of the arguments for carrying both bear spray and a firearm is that you give yourself that depth of defensive capability. But there's nothing wrong with carrying two cans of bear spray. Again, if I'm by myself and I'm not carrying a firearm, two cans of bear spray is not a bad idea. Okay. So, so. if I'm going to practice, though, with bear spray, that's a, that gets mm-hmm. expensive, right? I mean, I, if I'm using real bear spray, it's you know, probably 40 50 bucks a can. Uh, practice yep. bear spray where there's no um, chemical in there that's going to cause any sort of heat, I guess, like reaction, hot reaction, like a pepper spray. Uh, then we're talking yeah. like 20, maybe 25 bucks a can. Am I right on that? Yeah, you're about, I mean, that's what I found as well. Um, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, what's your cost if you're practicing with a firearm? For sure. I mean, right. So, you know, it's it's just one of these things that we all, I mean, we, we pay for our experience in our time and sometimes in our money, right? If you want to be proficient with a tool, you got to spend time with it. That means I would suggest you start with an inert can first, which is basically just compressed air right? Um, you're not going to hurt anybody with that. And you can practice drawing it. You can practice spraying it. You can get a feel for the spray. Yeah, it's going to cost you 20, 30 bucks a can. Um, but you're going to get that muscle memory, which is invaluable, right? And then you can step it up to an actual can of bear spray when you're going into the back country. So have you seen those, uh, those like, uh, fake bears on little go-karts that like you stand there and then they, you know, they blow the whistle or something. And all of a sudden you turn around and there's this bear coming at you. You got to pull out your bear spray as fast as you can yeah. <laughs> and spray. It. I have seen it. That's one, of, that's one of my favorite things about looking up like bear safety stuff online is to try and like see all the analogs that people come up with for trying to practice. Cause I mean, nobody has a bear that they can actually practice with. Um, and I've seen all sorts of things. I mean, there, there's rolling tires, there's the, the dollies that shooting ranges, the people trying, and those ones just make me laugh because there is no connection that it is so divorced from the reality of a bear charge that for me, it's just like, come on guys. That's, I mean, those are just moving at what 
10 miles an hour or something like that. You're talking at, a, at you know, a 400 pound animal that's moving at close to 40 miles an hour dead on you. Trust me, these are not good analogs. But then, they, you know, there's some go-karts I've seen. Um, they get up to about 20, 30 miles an hour when you're getting into the ballpark. So, I mean, I think they're valuable tools if you can find a good analog. I just think that people need to be aware that a lot of those are very poor analogs to practice yeah. with because it happens much faster than that. It's almost as if you can't really – I mean, what, what would you what would be your perfect scenario for practice? I mean, you know, I think of even just like with a firearm – you know, for defensive mm-hmm. use of a firearm, it's very difficult to practice yep. that. I mean, you can give all the training in the world, but it seems like whatever situation that actually comes up is nothing you ever practiced for. So, like in your in yeah. your in your situation, what would be what would be the ideal way to do this? You know, that is a little complicated. <laughs> so, I'm actually I'm going to be putting out a video, hopefully in the next few months, where I'm going to go through what I would suggest as my process, because that's the thing with a firearm specifically. <laughs> I mean, if you're comparing it with bear spray, bear spray, you have this cone of propellant that's coming out in a just broad cloud in front of you. It's so much easier if you even if you have even if you have crappy aim, it's so much easier to get that on target, especially if you've got some of that muscle memory going right than it is to draw a firearm and then to acquire your target yeah. and then to start squeezing off meaningful rounds. And that's the big thing. Meaningful rounds. Um, and that is just, I mean, we're talking about a level of proficiency I tell people, if you can shoot like, you know, the man with no name, the old Clint Eastwood, you know, um, Western movie hero, the spaghetti Western, if you can shoot like him and you can't, but if you can, then yeah, then I would, then you should be okay to be able to put those shots where they count, but you have to work on your, you have to work on your, your, your discipline for how you hold the gun, how your trigger pull discipline, your breathing discipline, your sight acquisition. I mean, there are so many things. And that's just when the gun's in your hand. If you then talk about you need to draw this thing out and you've got full pack and full gear on, I can tell you in my tests that I've run, it is a completely different scenario on unlevel ground to pull a firearm and then get those shots on target compared to practicing at a, a sterile fire range. Where everything's lined up in a perfect shot or a perfect lane, you know, yeah. it's there's just a lot that you have to put into, and I can't tell somebody the exact moment when I would say that they're ready um, to rely on that. I just think people need to prioritize proficiency as much as they can, and that means get education. That means practice dry fire. Um, I use snap caps a lot. Um, I think they're an underutilized tool. I don't know if you're familiar with no. snap caps. Mm-mm. So they're basically just a, they're basically an inert bullet, right? They don't have um, an actual, um, they don't have a well of powder. They don't have an igniter. They're just, I actually have some right here. So this is one um, for a forty-five seventy round. It's just a metal cylinder, but it's got a kind of a rubber and plastic um, pin on the back that you can, that your hammer can hit. So it's perfectly safe as long as you make the gun safe first. And you can just practice your finger pull discipline and your sight acquisition and all sorts of stuff. Now, of course, you have to fire live rounds before. I mean, you can't just practice with that and then load up a gun and head out. Right. But that's a good step to get very familiar with the gun and its mechanical function before you start putting live rounds through it. Would you recommend in a situation, let's say that there's a bear that's uh, seemingly aggressive. You've got your bear spray out. He's within maybe 30, 40 feet, would you recommend just spritzing a little spray to get it out there to cloud the area a little bit, make him uh, run off, or does that just agitate the bear? It would depend on how close they are to you. I mean, there are some people, you know, a bear shows up out of the brush at 10 feet. (laughs) You know, if it's that close, um, I would first try and, you know, I'd probably squeeze off a, a little spray, but it would just be like an initial burst, but I'd be ready to hold that thing down and just spray that thing point blank in the face. If it's 30 or 40 feet away, that's kind of in that, you know, on the boundary of the effective range of bear spray. So, you know, I would just, I'd get my bear spray ready first thing. That's top priority every single time. Get your deterrent ready. But if the bear is not behaving aggressively, I would slowly try and back away, right? The time that you really know that you want, like, that you need to spray is if that bear moves towards you in an aggressive manner at close range. So if it 
charges at you or if it slaps at you or something like that, yeah, then absolutely you want to spray. Aren't fatal bear attacks pretty rare? Um, there, I mean, it depends on how you define rare. I mean, if you talk about people going into the back country and coming home safe, they're unbelievably rare, right? Um, even if you have, I mean, if you think about how many people go recreating in the greater, greater Yellowstone ecosystem, where they have maybe about 700 brown bears and maybe twice that of black bears, I mean, you, you get one, maybe two attacks a year. And most of the time they're not fatal, but yeah, sometimes they are. Um, that's just, I mean, it's just very, very rare. But again, it's kind of like, you know, car accidents, right? You hop into your car, you're actually far more likely to get into a serious car accident than you are to be attacked by a bear. I, but you should always drive safely. You should always wear your seatbelt. You should always be bear aware. You should always have a deterrent with you. I, I just, I've still, I'm still struggling to understand why people are so cited on this. This, Like I said, that, that whole debate is so new to me. And I come from a yeah. firearm background, and I sort of worked my way into a bear spray world being in this backpacking world. Mm. But I live in Wisconsin in an area where there's no bears where I live at all. But it's just so interesting yeah. to see this this side. And I would look at it almost like if somebody's got bear spray out into the backcountry, I'm already very excited that they're doing something, if anything. And if it's the right choice, you know, then it's the right choice. Um, but, I mean, why, why don't people see it like that, would you think? Uh, one word comes to mind, baggage. When it comes to, you know, the conversation of firearms, there there is a wide and very aggressive argument taking place in society about firearms, about their proper use, about who should have them and all this kind of stuff. And people are just hypersensitive to it, right? And, you know, and the other thing is that firearms for, we're talking centuries, were literally the only deterrent there was, right? Bear spray showed up, you know, in the last 40 years, and it it's now having to kind of compete with a lot of comfort that people have had with firearms being their defense in the backcountry. So, and there are other people, I mean, the other thing is that bears are almost, almost mythical in the way people look at them, right? And people fear them. They're one of the most feared animals out there. I have one of my favorite comments ever on one of my videos. There was a guy from New, from Australia, and he's just like, you know, we got like the most poisonous snakes in the world and we got box jellyfish and we got all sorts of things. I will take those over grizzly bears any day of the week. Like he's just terrified of grizzly bears. Right. And it's I think people are just scared of them. And they're just there's inherently people feel more comfort if they feel like they can kill the animal rather than just deter it. So I think there are a lot of reasons. I can't speak for everybody out there. I can talk, you know, comments that people have, you know, shared with me and their feelings. But there's there's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of mythology. There are generations worth of a certain viewpoint of how you deal with a threat. And for this newer tool, bear spray, to kind of come in, sometimes people feel threatened by it. Sometimes they think it's a conspiracy that, you know, that people are trying to take away their firearms or something like that. And there's just a lot of a lot of noise that I think gets in the way. So I, I was hoping to clear up a lot of that when I put out not just my guns versus bear spray video, but a lot of my videos on bear safety. So. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I think I think yeah that that world is uh, very difficult to pull people out of once they've drawn conclusions. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's just a, it's just a tough world. Someone someone commented on your uh, video that I read. You only get one spray, and it may not even stop the bear. A gun kills. It's simple as that. Quit being anti-gun and arm yourselves. So are you anti-gun? I'm not anti-gun. That's what I tell people. I'm not anti-gun. I'm pro-proficiency. I'm pro-personal responsibility. Um, if I'm honest, I think the most anti-gun person you will ever meet in your life is somebody who has a hissy fit when you start talking about safety and firearms. <laughs> you know? Like... I'm sorry. If you're talking firearms, the very first thing we need to be talking about is safety. Um, because statistically speaking, far more people are injured, not maliciously by firearms. I'm talking accidentally. Just many, many more times the number of people that are attacked by bears are injured or killed by negligence with a firearm. Right. And so you're not an asset until you are sufficiently proficient and have a good head on your shoulders with that thing. I mean, a hand cannon doesn't make you any safer. Um, I tell people it's it's 
you know, a security blanket syndrome. People get it with bear spray. People get it with firearms. They think just by having it either in their backpack, which is a terrible place for bear spray, as you've already mentioned, um, that somehow it's going to protect them. They can't do anything back there. And a firearm, especially in a hostile encounter with a bear, isn't going to do anything for you unless you're sufficiently proficient with that firearm. And I don't care how many thousands of rounds you shot at a range. It's not the same thing. So it's just, it's, people don't like hearing that sometimes. Sometimes they just want to hear gun, gun, gun is the answer. Other people just want to hear bear spray, bear spray, bear spray is the answer. But I always say they're tools. You need to understand the proper use of the tool. Sure. So, yeah. Um, do you, so I was thinking about this um, as I was watching the video and I, I have no idea the answer. Um, and I'm wondering if you do. Does bear spray, does the effectiveness of bear spray change when you're at higher altitude or maybe a colder environment? Would you, would you know the answer to that by chance? Yeah, so there's actually some good, there are some papers out there on this topic. Um, in a cold environment, and we're talking like below freezing, um, the aerosol is, is a little less, um, it's a little more concentrated. So you have larger droplets of the actual active ingredient in the bear spray. And the range, because you have a larger, you know, droplet of water moving through air, has a somewhat reduced range um, to about, 14 to 20 feet, which is just shorter, right? Than a lot of the advertised range is about 30 feet. But, you know, it's absolutely still effective if you understand that limitation, right? And then in your uh, in your video, you mentioned Todd Orr. And yeah. um, it, was, it was funny. I had just messaged Todd Orr maybe two weeks ago, and we talked about possibly doing a podcast together. And yeah. uh, he, like you mentioned, was attacked twice by the same bear. And I believe it was actually after it charged through the bear spray in that situation. So in his situation, the bear spray yeah. um, wasn't necessarily effective. Of course, I we probably can't fully determine that. I mean, it probably had some sort of an effect on the bear, I would assume. But yeah, um, I mean, w- w- talk about it. Do you, I mean, are you familiar with his situation? Oh, I've actually talked to Todd. Todd's great. Okay. He actually called me or messaged me after he saw one of my videos. And he was great. He really wants to get his story out there. And it's, you know, his story in particular is just so informative on bear safety, um, the efficacy of bear spray. So as far as Todd Orr goes, I mean, it defines it depends on how you define bears or how do you define success, right? Or whether or not it was effective. So with Todd, for one, he was by himself, right? Which always puts you in a higher bracket of yeah. risk. Yeah, I want to talk country. about that too, but go on. We will. Um, yeah. But at the same time, while the bear did go through the kind of the, the cloud of spray, um, according to Todd, when I talked to him, there was still some residual benefit to that spray. And he said it to other people that she first, the, the mother grizzly attacked him, bit him a few times on the arm and then the shoulder. Um, but then he says that the bear spray started to get to her and he told me that she started like coughing on him. Oh, wow. So there was, there was some benefit to that bear spray, right? It wasn't that it didn't work or it did work. Clearly we could have had a better outcome for Todd, right? The best outcome would have been spray to the face, bears out of here. That's the ideal. But people do sometimes still, you know, incur some injuries even when they've successfully deployed bear spray. Todd Orr is one of those examples. So it's it's a little bit of that gray zone, right? So it's clearly not the ideal, but from my conversation with Todd, it seems like there was some residual benefit to his spray. I mean, I got to imagine uh, a mother grizzly protecting her cubs is willing to do whatever it takes, even go through the agony of bear spray to defend whatever's happening. I mean, you think about... Uh, a father trying to protect their kids, maybe, who gets sprayed with pepper spray. I mean, of course, that guy's going to fight through the, the pain. I, I don't know. I mean, it's obviously a massive difference there in 400-pound beast versus a human being. But I can just imagine that in that situation, I mean, in certain situations, I would assume that bears are going to act differently, more aggressively, maybe have even more adrenaline in some situations because of what's going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, bears, they're kind of hardwired in very similar ways to us, right? So they get all 
they get worked up, the adrenaline starts pumping, they get a little bit more resistant to pain. Um, so yeah, I mean, you have to assume that. But I mean, here's the thing is like, and that's the thing about Todd Orr's experience. There are, I mean, there's a guy by the name of Ben Mocked who was actually working in Yellowstone. He was attacked in almost the exact same location as Todd Orr. He was mountain biking and a mother grizzly kind of came out of the brush. He heard her just over his shoulder. He turned sprayed, but it was a different outcome. She had a full blast in her face and it just wow. overwhelmed any motivation on her part. She stumbled off into the brush and ran away. And we do have cases where it does work. So like I said, there's just a lot of variables. Um, I talked to Todd about his experience. He wasn't super sure. And this is common with bear attack victims. He wasn't super sure just what concentration of the spray actually got to the mother grizzly in his case. She came through that initial cloud and that first, that initial cloud is not exactly the same as like a point blank spray to the face, right? So in the case of Ben Mock, it was like a point blank spray to the face. It stopped her on a dime and sent her running. Same situation, you know, mother grizzly with cubs, slightly different outcome. She, maybe Todd's um, bear had a little less of a deposit of the actual spray. Maybe she pushed through it. I can't tell you, I can't get into her head. But you know, it, it illustrates that, yeah, it's not a 100%. It's not this magical force field that you carry with you, right? If you head into the back country, there are certain risks to spending time in the back country. Being attacked by a bear actually is not that great of a risk, um, but it does happen. So you should be prepared for it, um, you know, and you can find examples of where in Todd's case, maybe it could have worked better. Um, but there are plenty of other examples of people who have stopped even mother grizzlies on a dime and just sent them running with bear spray. So would you say that one of the best deterrents is to hike in groups? Oh, absolutely. There is, there is no better deterrent. And I've talked about this at length with um, a number of biologists on this. They're just like, listen, like, yes, we need to have the conversation about deterrence, but your absolutely best deterrent, the bar none, is a good head on your shoulders and being with other responsible people. Um, bears are risk averse. So we like to think of them as just these like vicious, furry locomotives with teeth, right? But they're risk averse and they don't grow old by being overly aggressive. So, and numbers matter in the backcountry. If you are with other people, if you know to stand your ground, if you stay close together, and again, to quote Todd Smith, chances are you don't even need the bear spray. That's not telling him you should, that's not him telling people you shouldn't have it. But sure. he says, and to quote him, he says he's not aware of a single case, not one case where two people stood their ground and a bear even made contact with them. Interesting. Okay? And that's during a charge. So it by far the most important thing you can do is to be with other people, especially those who know what they're doing. Wow. And then you add on top the conversation about deterrence and who carries what and how do you use it. So, Would you argue that bear spray is effective against other animals as well? Oh, I, I don't even have to argue it. It, it is effective at other, against other animals. There are plenty of cases of mountain lions being deterred by bear spray. Um, you know, the data set isn't going to be as large as, say, bears, because bears are kind of the animal that, you know, as far as wild, animal, wild animals go, they attack more people than any of the other options out there. I, I don't see why. Yeah, I, no, it works on... I don't see a uh, uh, mountain lion spray in the stores, so I think, uh, I think you should market that. You'd make a ton of money. <laughs> you should start selling I don't have a marketing. <laughs> just rebrand it <laughs> I, I don't have a marketing mindset I would I would be trying to market this product and be like man I don't want to be marketing I want to be out in the mountains somewhere <laughs> so yeah right that's... what about what about dogs what about dogs as being a deterrent yeah so again we're talking there's some nuance to this conversation but I've actually put out a video on this very topic called how dogs cause bear attacks and okay. it's something that, I mean, if you, if anybody has a dog and they like taking their dog for a walk, they really need to watch the video. And that may be a little bit of shameless self-promotion, but the video itself gets into the nitty gritty detail. Again, best, best information you can find on the topic. Um, dogs in particular are a problem with all wild animals, all of them. Um, and that comes from a dog owner. I've had dogs for most of my life. I remember there was this one time 
my wife and I were driving. We saw this big herd of big herd of bighorn sheep, and we rolled down the window to take a picture in our car. And our pointer jumped out of the car through the open window and, you know, ran after these animals, right? And I'm like, I was trying to be a responsible dog owner. We were in the car. I thought we were okay. It was a hard lesson learned, right? And then just a few miles um, in National Forest um, here in Utah last year, there were three dogs killed inside of a month by mountain goats. Oh, wow. Because people were walking around. Yeah, walking around with, you know, their dogs off leash, the dogs approached these mother goats, which then gored them and in one case threw a dog over a cliff. Oh, you know, geez. now that's a goat. That's a goat. Now we step that up to a like a mother bear with cubs. You're you're playing with fire, right? And there's a really good correlation. And again, I get, I have all the all the numbers and the detail in my video how dogs cause bear attacks. But as a general rule, Dogs are a big problem. That, that's going to cause a lot of people to be upset. Uh, I can already see it. I can and already I, have I can all these that. people that, that, that hike with their dogs are going to be very angry you said that. Yeah. And everybody's going to be like, not my dog. And I understand. I understand. Because like I said, I've had dogs my whole life. I love dogs. They're great companions. Um, I go hiking with my dogs. So I have a deep library of experience. But you need to understand how the dog's presence actually ups the, fa- the, the danger factor. And that includes, even if you're hiking with other people, there was one case uh, north of Yellowstone where two guys were walking with a dog off leash, came across a mother grizzly, the dog harassed the mother grizzly, and she came darting right back and she attacked the two guys. Wow. The one thing you have to understand about your dog, especially if they're off off leash, they are a lot more nimble (laughs) than you are. (laughs) And they are far more likely to be able to dodge a bear than you are, right? And anyways, and there's another guy, and this is the example that maybe will drive it home in the in the clearest possible terms. Um, you know, I think it was um, about five or six years ago, there was a houndsman, so a guy who trains dogs, a hunter who trains dogs to pursue mountain lions and bears for hunting purposes. And he was out running his 35 dogs, 35, keep that number in mind. And they came across the scent of a black bear. They chased that lone male black bear down and started harassing that bear. And he was in a side-by-side, so he's not even on foot, right? And he's, he's going to try and call his dogs back, and they're just in a frenzy. They're not listening. He goes and he gets up and he sees this bear um, that his dogs are now surrounding and harassing. And this, this bear was supercharged because it couldn't get away. The dogs were harassing it. And... He decided, well, I better give myself a bigger buffer. So he backed up. His dogs picked up on that cue, and they started running. And that bear just tore after him. And it was it was one of the most, I mean, remarkable bear attack accounts that I've ever come across. And 35 dogs, 35, not a one of them helped him. It was just that bear got a hold of him, and the dogs were gone. Right? Wow. So... It's now that's not me saying that that's going to be the case every time. There are some dogs like Karelian bear dogs that are specifically trained to keep the pressure on a bear and harass it and keep, you know, keep it focused on the dog. But you're talking about a highly specialized skill set for those dogs. Your average person taking their dog out into the woods, I I would I would suggest that they just plan on if a bear, if their dog comes across a bear, it's going to be it's going to create a problem. And that their dog most likely is not going to be very helpful. But again, I, I there may be dogs that are highly protective, very aggressive, that will help. Certainly there are cases with black bears where that has happened. But again, this is a, a nuanced conversation. Everybody likes to think that it's old yeller, right? And the dog's just going to come running out of the brush and save the little boy from, you know, in, in the movie it was a wolf, but or bear or whatever it is. You know, this is reality. This isn't Hollywood. You need to go prepared for reality in the backcountry, not the fairy tale. Wow. So, do you think that it's better to have your dog leashed? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you need to have your dog under control at all times. I mean, it's not that some dogs maybe wouldn't be okay off leash, but for the most part, that's a prohibited practice. And it's because dogs cause problems with other dogs, they cause problems with wildlife, they can cause problems with other people. So, yeah. 
I'm going to be real, man. I can't handle when people don't have their dog's leash and I'm hiking on the trail and some dog runs up to me. Like, I don't know your dog. You might love your dog. Your dog might be the friendliest thing in the world, but I don't know your dog. Get that thing away from me. <laughs> I'm going to whack it with yeah, my trekking pole. <laughs> There's the basic courtesy. <laughs> That's just, just common courtesy, man. Going. If you're so, watching this and yeah. I come walking down a trail, you better have your dog on a leash. I think last week I had two dogs jump on my leg while I was just walking, while I was hiking. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, I'm a dog person, but, you know, it's not cool. It's not cool. Keep your dog under control. That's just the courtesy thing. But then you get into the safety thing. Yeah. In the backcountry, that dog needs to be under control. So, but yeah. I should mention, to get to our conversation about guns versus bear spray, this guy who was attacked by this black bear after his, his hounds just harassed the thing, um, he was able to finally end the attack, and he used a 10-millimeter semi-auto handgun, right? But he, from my estimates, or from the estimates that I've heard, he landed about 8 to 10 shots, and that bear was still coming at him. Holy right? cow. Yeah, and part of that is going to be, of course, shot placement, right? You have to land those shots where they matter. But you have to understand, these bears, if you've ever seen two bears go at each other, they have a very high pain threshold. And even if they're mortally wounded, they don't know they're mortally wounded. Um, they can take a lot of punishment. And so part of the issue was he had just regular self-defense ammunition, um, which is probably ideal for a home intruder, bad idea for a bear. You don't get nearly the same kind of results. So he, he finally ended the attack point blank by shooting the bear in the head. Um, oh, that geez. was while the bear was locked on, <clears throat> locked onto his leg, right? Oh my so gosh. I think we'd all agree you don't want the bear to get that far. Wow, to even have but the competency to do that. <laughs> I mean, a bear's yeah. locked on my leg. How do you uh, – yeah, okay. That's that's impressive. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's 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 a – it's a ridiculous story. And, you know, I mean, what a story to be able to tell people, but yeah, I mean, it gets on to this conversation of using a firearm, much, much higher level of proficiency that I think people generally understand. And then you have a whole conversation about ammunition types and, yeah, and for sure. loads because you, you have your FBI loads that are designed for people. They're not designed for bears. You have to generally use some hotter loads. So anyways, that's a little bit of a regress back in time, but it's related to our conversation about dogs for and sure. deterrence and stuff like that. For sure. So um, should people be afraid now to go into the backcountry? Are we deterring people from – are we saying you shouldn't be in the mountains somewhere in the middle of Wyoming? Or what are we telling people here? So I actually – this year for the first time, um, I'm going to be traveling to the greater Yellowstone area with my brother and his wife and their kids. And my brother's been to Yellowstone when he was like – 12 or 14 or something. Um, and we're going to go camping and his wife has been pretty nervous, right? And she's been nervous about bears and about the kids. And so we've been talking about it. Um, you really, people who just take some basic precautions, keep a clean camp, right? Um, or don't lather themselves in like berries and honey and then go sleep under the stars or something. Um, you, you're generally going to be okay, especially if you're in a, in a developed campground. Um, follow the precautions that are posted. I highly advise that you have at least bear spray. Um, in brown bear country, probably in black bear country as well. But don't take it as a security blanket. Spend some time practicing with it. And if you just educate yourself, there's no reason to be worried about bears. Like, I average... I average about 10 bear encounters a year and have for more than a decade now. Um, and bears are generally really courteous animals. They sure. don't want trouble. Sure. They want they want to be away from you. They don't want to be close to you. You know, sometimes people get surprised, the bear gets surprised, and there's a conflict, so you should be prepared for it. But overall, if you educate yourself a little bit, and I've tried to put resources out there for people, you don't need to be scared of bears. A little bit of knowledge goes a long way. And then statistically speaking, it's just not a big concern. Yeah. Right. You should be a lot more concerned about the other drivers on the road. Yeah, exactly. Um, you're, you're a lot more likely to, to get in, killed on the way to your trip outdoors somewhere, right? Yeah. No. Wild animal attacks are way, way, way low on the list of fate, like the cause of death when visiting a national forest or a national park. You should be far more concerned about drownings, falling from a cliff, 
you know, those or car accidents, those those kill many, many, many more times the number of people yeah. as like a wild animal attack. Yeah. So how can people find you? Yeah. So at home in wild spaces, um, just look up my channel. If you're looking specifically for bear stuff, I cover a lot of other things from e-bikes and hiking practices and stuff like that. But if you're looking for bear safety stuff, I, I've tried to put this all out there so people know where to get it. Just at home in wild spaces. You can do just type bears. You can type bear attacks or gun versus bear spray or dogs. Um, how dogs cause bear attacks. All of those things are up there. I even have one about trying to beat up a grizzly bear to try and fight it off. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, so that's probably I, a bad I idea is what you're saying? Out. I'm going to guess that's a bad idea. Yeah. You know, the, the elevator pitch is yes. It's not the greatest idea. Um, All right. But you have much better options if you just take a little time to prepare. So yeah, it's all there. Um, spend. I mean, it's time well spent. Educate yourself, and you can have an amazing time in bear country. It's one of those. Maybe this. Maybe this is what I would lead, What I would end on. I get a lot of people who tell me the only way to guarantee you're never going to be attacked by a bear is to never go into bear country, and there's some truth to that. But there's also a danger in that that I don't think people understand. If you're afraid to go into bear country you're not connecting with the landscape that these animals depend on, right? And these animals in the landscape, they don't, they can't advocate for themselves. The, the wild spaces that a lot of us cherish where our water comes from, where a lot of our food comes from, even though we don't know it, they come from places that bears occupy, right? We have a, we have a vested interest in protecting these places. And if we just decide we never want to go there because we're scared of bears, chances are we're not going to be aware of what we stand to lose if we don't connect with these wonderful landscapes. So that's really what I try to do. I want people to have the tools. I want people to be safe. I want people to be responsible. But if you have the tools and a little bit of education, you can have the most amazing times in bear country. You know, awesome. Most incredible experiences. So That's awesome. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on, talking to us, and uh, enlightening People in uh, discussing this hot topic, I'm sure the comments are going to be hot in this video as well, which is totally fine. Please be respectful. We'd really appreciate that. And uh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. So we'll see you all on the next one.